Ladies and gentlemen, hello. My name is Nigel Smith. I am your moderator for a third in a series of webinars proposed by the Council of Europe entitled Data Protection Views from Strasbourg in Visio. We have today a strong lineup of experts. So please use the Q&A tool within the BlueJeans environment to keep your questions coming in. We have a team of Council of Europe staff on standby to take your questions. You can either put your points to the experts yourself or I can ask them on your behalf. Without further ado, let me go to Yet Jen Person. She is the first speaker today to address the theme, what does the right to data protection imply in an educational setting? Jen, welcome. You have the floor. 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Nigel. And thank you. It's an honor to be here. I shall share my slides and my screen. And we'll get started. So the draft data protection guidelines in education setting have been in preparation for over a year with the Council of Europe and the Committee uh, for the Convention 108. It is perhaps not more timely than now to be discussing the data protection implications of remote learning, when over 90% of learners around the world have been out of the classroom uh, due to the pandemic. Whilst our data, um, the education settings vary around the world, today we find that a lot of the common platforms and apps and tools shared across the world share similar questions and concerns. It is therefore very beneficial to have a shared piece of legislation and guidelines when it comes to common platforms and apps that have no geographical boundaries. So what do the draft guidelines look like? We have very limited time this afternoon, so we will touch on some of the highlights. The scope, purpose, definitions and principles are all consistent with the practical aspects of the Convention and Convention 108. The fundamental principles of children's data protection are the same as for any other person. What matters, I think, when we start to look at education is to consider what are the particular implications when we look at children's data and children's rights in an education setting. And so some of these we have drawn out in the guidelines, the capacity of a child the right to be heard. We have drawn recommendations for different groups. So we have looked at um, recommendations for legislators and policymakers, most of which apply to all types of um, policy, uh, whether it's uh, looking, trying to bring, uh, bring the different parallels across different aspects of legislation together, to look at legislation around data protection, not as standalone, but as part of other legislative frameworks. We have made recommendations for data controllers, for processing in practice in education, which means in educational settings, and also for looking at the specifics around emerging technologies, particularly that then has implications for industry, and there is a section dedicated to that. But we also go further and ask what more may be needed and where may data protection have limitations that don't protect all the rights of the child in the education setting. It is pertinent, but we'll talk more in more detail later to ask what difference does distance learning make? But in fact, most of the questions we'll address now have only been exacerbated at speed and scale by the increase of remote learning, and most apply to all types of tools, regardless of location. The resolution from the 2018 International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners made an extensive document and recommendations around practice for learning platforms. The key points we want to draw out is that they can have significant long-term social, economic and professional consequences. Why does this matter for children in particular? Because datafied from birth, it will have lifetime consequences which may not yet be apparent. And the second point we need to draw out for children in particular is that they have evolving capacities. The child is developing, the child has rights, and that they develop over time 
in relation to their adult, their legal guardian and teachers and the professionals that they come into contact with on an everyday basis in education. What else is particular to education is that the sensitivity of children's personal data should not be underestimated. This doesn't only apply to uh, the types of data that are considered sensitive or special category data, but things that will last a lifetime for a child, behavioral data, records about their sexual orientation or sexuality, gender, and questions that may, um, may be opinion and rather than fact in a record. Questions around a family's status or a family's um, interactions with social care can be of extreme sensitivity and yet may not be quite classified as sensitive data in data protection terms. So what does the types of data look like for a child in education and why does it matter? Why does it particular to education that we look at this with special guidelines? The types of data that are drawn out across a day will be very different depending on your educational setting, whether um, you are a home learner, an adult learner, or a child. However, the implications of digital tools are very similar. Most are cloud-based, which means that your personal data no longer sits in a single setting, but is stored and can be shared at speed and scale with an indefinite number of third parties. This big data wheel imagines the day in the life of a typical 11 year old in a UK school, obviously with my um, expertise coming particularly with the UK. And this will vary, obviously, for every location around the world. But it highlights some of the key issues that particular technologies draw out. The questions around, um, for example, whether platforms are monitoring you, uh, whether you are logged on to a school system, and looking at the types of behavioral data that you carry out from just interacting with the platform. That's particularly important because we need to understand what data are collected about a child. When it's obvious that a school is collecting information from the legal guardian and the parents, it may be the types of data that you see for the purposes in the center of this wheel, for the administration of the child's education. And they may be the child's name, address, and personal details, which are clear and obviously collected. But there'll be lots of information that are inferred by a platform or an app that the child and the family do not see. This type of information can be called fingerprinting. It's nothing to do with biometrics, but it's tracking the behaviors, the interactions with the user between the user and the keyboard, or the user and the types of um, how many mouse clicks they make, for example. A great deal of information like that is collected for data analytics and is very hidden data, which, which people effectively do not can see and cannot control. There can be an indefinite number of apps used in many schools, whether this is around particular subjects like math, science, languages, using quizzes to fill in a, a small part of a lesson, and records around behavior can be collected through apps. Many of these will be owned by third parties that uh, schools may not have the competence to really truly understand who lies behind the app. Where is the data stored? Which company is part of a, a larger conglomerate? How many of these apps, for example, about 25% uh, of the current market is uh, Chinese owned or in chi Chinese uh, private equity, about 50% is owned uh, in the current market of educational apps in US ownership. And many apps that appear small companies are in fact part of large affiliated conglomerates. This kind of implications not only for the child's data storage, but also when it simple terms and conditions explain things like we may share this data with our affiliates. It actually means that the child, the child and the family and even the school has very little idea what that actually means in practice. There's also a great number of emerging technologies being tested in schools. For example, artificial intelligence, <laughs> which may not be familiar uh, or very, very well understood in other sectors, but could be used to personalize a child's learning platform, a child's learning journey through um, their education, and is using the personal data to map uh, what the child may see next in the curriculum or, or study next. And that could be different from their classmate. Again, it can be very hard for the school to understand those algorithms and to truly understand how much data is collected. 
for example, one leading platform in the UK um, claims that from every mouse click it collects uh, data and can therefore infer even if a child has autism, for example. And there can be very sensitive data collected around um, things like biometrics used for cashless payment systems or library systems. So when we look at this very large uh, number of uh, actors in the education sector, we can understand why Bianca Wiley recently wrote that technology procurement is one of the largest democratic vulnerabilities that exist today. Not only because uh, it is a pathway into the education system in terms of which companies are part of your educational state infrastructure, but also in terms of security. In fact, the FBI only last week issued a statement, uh, a warning to the US schools that ransomware and security has become a, a very increased problem in uh, the through the increase of remote learning recently. So what other um, aspects have we got to protect children when it comes to data protection and thinking about how that goes hand in hand with procurement? If you look at the UN General Comment number 16, it set out the state obligations on the impact of business on child rights. They are both positive and negative that public procurement should only be awarded to companies that respect child rights and that there should not be investment in companies that don't. The implications of this is that child rights risk assessment should be part of procurement systems. And that is perhaps in addition to data protection impact assessment, which we think of naturally as part of data protection uh, guidelines. We also need to consider beyond the data protection impact assessment, what is the impact to the child? I feel very strongly that how we allow machines to measure children reveals very much our measure of our humanity. It suggests to us how compassionate we are with children, what where expectations are for them, what uh, and how we might treat them as future adults. We've selected some of the most pressing uh, personal and social challenges that exist in uh, data protection. The rights of the child and the role of the legal guardian are particularly problematic when it comes to consent. Consent in a school is a very difficult position to ask for freely and without detriment, both because the child is disempowered by the nature of the relationship with the school and also simply from being a child is very hard to make sure that uh, the na nature of data processing is truly understood. And even with the complexity of today's technology, it is hard to say that a school can truly understand the nature of the processing. So agency and consent in a compulsory setting is very difficult. The emerging harms we need to consider beyond the individual child and developing uh, adult, but also to think around collective harms. This is particularly important for vulnerable communities, Roma, Gypsy, refugees, and increasingly across any type of population where aggregated characteristics can be used to the detriment of a particular community. So we may be looking at data that is very sensitive, not even just for an individual, but as part of a group. Important in education, I think, is also to note how much data is inferred and is opinion. But when it becomes digitized and as part of a system, is perceived as fact, and it's given the same weighting as perhaps true uh, information might be. That's very problematic when it lives with a child for life. And again, the final point uh, that I think we have to look around the personal and social challenges for school data is the implications for personalization and profiling. And we should look at these guidelines very much together with the recently published guidelines on profiling, as well as the recently published guidelines from the Council of Europe on artificial intelligence. So we'll wrap up shortly with um, some of the key system and systemic challenges. The guidelines touch on the implications for developers. And I think one of the, the hardest to understand for people outside of the education system and outside of the, the, those who might develop code is something that Jun Zhao of the Computer Science Lab at uh, Oxford raised recently has published a paper on, that the reuse of code by developers can often mean that when uh, a developer borrows code from another app or something that's already built, they may not fully understand how the system works themselves. 
And that has implications not only for the full implications of its data processing, but also how difficult it is for a school to do due diligence and to be able to demonstrate transparency to parents. The types of uh, data that are collected can also, as we touched on earlier, create a lot of new data through inferences. And the retention of that data and its reuse can be very problematic when people don't know it was collected at all. We're also looking at um, perhaps the questions of re-identification. How difficult it is to anonymize data today means that we have to be very, very careful around retention and make sure that we are truly um, not, you know, not building up records for children for life that because they're assumed to be uh, made sort of pseudonymous or, or no longer uh, able to understood, that that is fact very clearly not anonymous data and should fall under the protections of the convention and other data protection law. Again, one of the biggest um, systemic challenges we have in education is that these cloud systems are always on and now no longer sit only inside the classroom, but follow the child home for homework. And obviously in current settings means uh, uh, use of remote learning tools at home. And this constant behavioral tracking is a growing trend, not only from uh, what the child has done themselves on, on a system and what how they have completed a tool or used a program, but also just in terms of how the systems are, are built. And this ad tech surveillance ecosystem is something that truly needs better understood when we uh, mean that lots of data is collected about the child's interactions with the tool. The, the uh, systems will know when a child was online, where they were online, how often they mouse clicked, where they looked, what they did. And those types of tools are only growing as um, more sort of store is put by data analytics. And that means there are greater implications for data accountability, not only at the point of collection, but through the life cycle of data. And then we have several questions that are touched on by data protection law, that they are the first line of defense, if you like, but they go beyond and demand greater collaboration and cooperation, both across data protection supervisor authorities and other areas of consumer rights and competition law. These are particularly important around emerging technologies for example, the research that uh, Professor Erica Southgate has done in Australia around immersive virtual reality and uh, ask important questions around ethics and safety. We need to be open to consideration what the implications are for the use of proprietary systems where much of the ed tech market is closed. It has significant implications for data control, not only for the child themselves, but for the whole of a public or state education system. The values that the companies put into these systems and how transparent they are. And that then has greater implications when we look at the types of tools that have global ownership and control. When a small app that perhaps determines which book your child will read next is actually owned by a private equity based in the Cayman Islands and their personal data can be shared across the whole of that affiliated company. And there are also great questions that are perhaps as pressing in many regions of the world, but no more so at the moment than in the global south, of the values and the educational implications for the growing use and, and the, the importance given techno to technology in the global south, where access and accessibility standards are not determined perhaps by the state, but by the, the company. So these are some of the, the aspects that we perhaps pulled out today. Um, and I think the largest question we would come away with is that the guidelines for uh, data protection and education are absolutely vital at the moment. They have perhaps never been more urgent, but they must be seen as part of the bigger picture and fit into the tools that the data protection supervisory authorities, that states and that um, educational sector can use as part of a larger uh, set of tools when they look at the legislative frameworks around education and data processing and include things like consumer law, competition law, equality law, and uh, use that as part of their greater um, collaboration and cooperation in future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jen, for a, uh, an excellent uh, presentation, which clearly uh, sets out the urgency of the issues that we're discussing today. I was particularly struck by your quote, how we allow machines to 
um, measure children as a measure of our own humanity. I think that's something that we can uh, perhaps discuss in the questions. So please send your questions in uh, using the Blue Jeans Q&A tool. Let me now go to our second speaker uh, from Ghana, which is uh, Patricia Poku. Patricia, are you online? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon okay. from where I am. Patricia. Welcome, Patricia. You I have, have 10 a... minutes, please. OK, I have a presentation sent to you that I'm hoping can be displayed for me, if possible. Yes, we can do that. Just let us know when we have to change the slides, please. OK. So we've got your first slide on now. Protecting personal data in so, the education setting. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm, I'm also explaining uh, as a supervisory authority based in Ghana what our expectations are of those in the educational setting and what some of the surrounding issues are currently. Next slide, please. So looking at uh, education, we focus on other older children, students, people in learning uh, 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 and more adult institutions where they learn all the way to children in education. Uh, and, and I just wanted to add a bit of the COVID-19 uh, perspective on it because it's obviously changed the way we work so much. We have a directive uh, from our president that instructs uh, currently all final year students to go back to school to sit their exams, recognizing that the COVID-19 is something that we have to live with and have to adjust our lifestyles to, other than waiting for it to completely disappear. So currently in Ghana, education is ongoing for final year students, whilst the rest of our students and, and children are at home. And, and, and as part of the COVID-19, we've come to uh, recognize that it's brought health information sharing to the core as far as education is concerned and, and uh, that has also its implications. Next slide please. Hello. So when we're looking at educational facilities uh, and, and the rights of data subjects, we're looking at the rights of not just the student, but the teaching staff, non-teaching staff, visitors to schools and suppliers, and, and how that can be aligned with uh, the understood international best practice principles, such as purpose limitation, data minimization, access limitation, data security, data retention, and health data relating to education. These are all uh, issues that have become very contemporary here and being discussed in different uh, forums from different angles, uh, looking at what purpose uh, that uh, institutions, educational institutions are uh, collecting data, new data for, or what the existing databases can be repurposed or to support the current situation and what that throws up for us as supervisory authorities as challenges to address. The need to uh, minimize the use of data to a purely need to know uh, and how to en encourage different types of access, which uh, uh, the previous presenter has touched on. Uh, next slide, please. So it's taken a while for me to see my next slide. So there's, there's the imminent threat to public health and safety uh, and measures, uh, uh, schools are having to take new measures to protect uh, health data of their data subjects, being students or their staff or the general public. And but the main message that is going out from us as the supervisory authority is saying that the, these extraordinary grounds for processing data in, de, uh, in different ways uh, may only be used to justify the only necessary and reasonable measures that needs to be taken to protect individuals and their data. And so this uh, pandemic and the situation shouldn't be our means to uh, uh, repurpose data unnecessarily or to uh, commence the use of uh, child data or student data for new purposes that 
has previously not been authorized or been legal to do. So we are keeping an eye out to ensure that it's still restricted and seen as special category data for the purposes that uh, it's been uh, collected to be processed. Next slide, please. So we, we are working with educational institutions and advising uh, and engaging with them to uh, um, use data in a specific way uh, uh, that is slightly different from our usual status quo way of uh, uh, processing personal data. But we are asking for new education to students and families about respecting the privacy of individuals in the educational setting. In Ghana, uh, we have had uh, 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 a few people who have had the COVID virus in this category as students and children, and we are dealing with a whole lot of stigmatization because of the way information has been shared and given out, uh, and we are now doing a new form of education around how children should uh, understand the need to avoid stigmatization uh, as a result of information that has come to them, uh, perhaps regarding a classmate or a schoolmate, or from the education administration uh, themselves of how they have shared information. Knowledge and understanding about information sharing with only critical stakeholders on the need to know basis has become a very important message to put out there, uh, uh, because we find that out of panic information is being shared uh, and too much sometimes is being shared uh, unnecessarily, and the rights of individuals are not carefully uh, being respected. And so we are putting out this new form of education that uh, is about understanding what to share, when to share, how to share, and also uh, uh, with the aim of avoiding uh, the surrounding stigmatization that is very prevalent in the African region right now because of the health circumstances. Uh, fair processing notices has become something that we put out there to uh, inform data subjects of all uh, demographics and uh, parents, uh, guide, guide, uh, guidance um, for children and for adult students to make them aware of what they can and cannot expect of information that they have shared with educational institutions. We are asking for clear and plain language of information that is put out in educational uh, institutions now, and we are also promoting the uh, enabling of transparency around who, what, where, and how around information in the education setting. Next slide. I think there's a bit of delay in uh, my speaking and the change of slides, I apologize for that. Another focus area for us is the security measures that is to be adopted in protecting uh, personal data. Uh, over in the African region, it's not all digitized records. A high percentage of records here are still in manual systems. So we're looking at how to apply security measures in both uh, manual records and digital records. We're focused on understanding the retention policies that need to be uh, uh, in place for different categories of uh, data and also to read the existing data systems with uh, implementation of these disposal plans for uh, not holding data for longer than is necessary. Uh, the uh, importance of international transfer, of, uh, especially for boarding schools, children who are traveling in and out of the country uh, and the health data. Uh, the environmental security, obviously, for the manual uh, data, the environment that data is being held and processed in is very important now. Use of peripheral de devices because children are not mainly classroom based now. The, the movement of data uh, is not so uh, uh, smooth as in other uh, countries where the digitized platforms are very uh, active and effective. Over here, a lot of peripheral devices are being used to move data from one location to the other to enable remote working, for example. And we are now having to engage with uh, decision makers around the use of these systems to enable maximum safeguarding of child data especially. We are also looking at uh, subject access requests uh, uh, from children uh, and, and their parents and their, guide, their, their, their uh, guidance uh, 
uh, adults who will uh, have the uh, responsibility of engaging on behalf of children uh, and how that can be enabled uh, so that legal obligations will be met and individual rights uh, can be uh, assessed uh, asserted, uh, adequately. We're looking at access to records and how quickly and effectively individuals can get access to their records when needed. All these are new and recent challenges that have come to the fore because of the change in our, our health system because of COVID-19 and the contemporary way of working, remote, remote learning, online learning has thrown out a whole lot of challenges for us. Next slide, please. We're looking at the, the, how we enable information sharing that is effective and efficient uh, around uh, key stakeholder uh, entities between education institutes and health uh, department, for example, and, and also uh, other government institutions that have a role to play in the safeguarding of children and how information can be managed uh, alongside the need to manage consent and, and the difficulties around managing consent in our region has become a very uh, contemporary discussion because of a whole lot of issues that uh, uh, would go beyond 10 minutes if I were to get into it. But consent has become a, a hot topic now around the management of child data uh, in the current uh, uh, pandemic. We're looking at new policies that need to be Oh, if we can go back a slide so I can get uh, uh, more information out, please. So we're looking at new information and policies that we can engage uh, data controllers to uh, to document policies like email policies, uh, bring your own device policies as there's an increased use of uh, remote working touch rooms for children, distance learning, and, and the need for social distancing uh, in the midst of all of that has become new areas of policies that we need to push out to educational institutions. We're looking at e-safety. While children are spending more time online uh, studying, we're looking at e-safety, uh, collaborating with other entities such as the National Cyber Security Secretariat and child online safety groups to look at e-safety, use of mobile phones, website use, and the, the presence of inappropriate matter online in this region is a key area that we are looking at. Also, they need to um, ensure that educational, uh, educational institutions implement proper privacy programs uh, in, their, uh, edu uh, in their institutions. We're looking at the appointments of data protection officers uh, where necessary in Ghana. We call them data protection supervisors. Uh, where where they are needed and the institution is large enough, we're insisting that they uh, send someone to be trained as data uh, protection officers to enable the implementation of a proper framework for managing and safeguarding uh, child data and student data. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you, Patricia, for giving us an update of what is happening in um, Ghana. Clearly, uh, the pandemic has been an opportunity to raise awareness around some of the issues that uh, both speakers have addressed in their presentations. Let me now bring in Pascal Serrier. Pascal, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Pascal. Thank you. Okay, um, yes. You have 10 uh, minutes, please. Yes, okay. Thank you. So, you know, it's very... Uh, um, it's a very good opportunity now to speak after my colleagues, you know, because most challenges have been said, and I will try to provide you uh, with more achievements that the data protection community has achieved so far in education at large, and all the more since now having switched to online learning, you know, that we need to uh, to concentrate on key issues and. Uh, to accompany schools, families, students in their in their remote learning now. So you know uh, the the key driving role of the Digital Education Working Group, which is part of the Global Privacy Assembly, has uh, um, 
has been established a few years ago and I think has done quite a huge job uh, based on the success stories of individual members, of individual authorities, um, concrete deliver deliverables, materials that are made available. The objective is to improve awareness and to develop skills and abilities in a consistent manner. So, um, first, first slide, please. Next one. Thank you. Regarding to the role of our data protection authority. So, the next slide should arrive. So, it, it refers to the role of regulators, you know, in the GDPR. Uh, if you look at Article 57B, the, yes, thank you. The, the role is, of course, to promote public awareness and understanding of the risks, rules, and safeguards and rights. So, in relation to the processing. So, activities should be addressed specifically to children and they shall receive specific attention. But our data protection authorities haven't uh, waited until this, uh, um, this provision, you know, to start uh, working on a voluntary basis with uh, their national actors. So, regarding the overview, next slide please, of the priorities which have been set by and established by the Digital Privacy Education Working Group. Uh, we benefit all from experience of each other, and this is a priority topic. You will see on the following slide. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, it's a priority topic that provides a real consensus uh, between data protection authorities. That's very important because, as I said, we can benefit from each other's experience and new innovative ideas. Uh, of course, uh, we have been conducting some studies to, to map the best practices, best tools, which can foster digital education. Uh, it was a common consensus that children were identified as constituting the main target group of data protection initiatives, but uh, in, the, in the same process, uh, stu students, but also educators, and now I should I should add families also are considered as key target groups as it has already been said you know in this specific period so and the, the way we can work also is to address international key resolutions for educational settings that's what we have done over the recent years can we can I get to the, the next slide please Yes. Okay. This is a, um, an overview of the materials which uh, data protection authorities have been developing, and you can see either individually or um, on a with partner partnering with um, Safety Internet with other other actors uh, to provide tools that can be used by young generations. So, websites, of course, we have official website, but website dedicated to children and to kids as well are very important. Uh, escape games, videos, clips, cartoons, the way we may communicate with uh, young people. Uh, of course, for teachers, there has been a lot of booklets, magazines, uh, posters, but comics, theater plays, you know, data protection authority can be approached in a very different way and innovative way. And of course, media now, nowadays, are more and more used to, to, com to communicate with uh, schools and student, students to provide them with some pieces of advice and good practices. I, I, sh I would like to mention with schools, developing a national competition uh, has been a really um, popular uh, initiative. Uh, we, we mapped a few years ago uh, some, um, uh, some most of the initiative which had been developed by the individual uh, data protection authority with schools or with other institutional partners. And uh, this is a very fun, fun fun way and a very uh, proactive way to have children and peers committed in the, the, the understanding of what is the personal data and what are the risks involved. So, and the Global Privacy Award in Education uh, every year also can, can uh, pro prove the, the, the innovative approach developed by data protection authorities. 
So let's look at, at the next slide. You know, you will see a variety, you know, a series of, of different uh, content, uh, videos uh, um, of, uh, for, for kids, for younger ch children. Uh, on the next slide as well, you will have an illustration of the way to communicate also with uh, teenagers uh, in the, with the Canadian Graffle novel. Uh, the Irish manual as well, and all the materials have been developed in cooperation and uh, tested at children's uh, uh, by, by our counterparts, you know, in their own country. On the following slide, this is another example of what we have been developing uh, in France with the YouTubers also. So uh, this, this is a, a good way to approach uh, young people and the material available for teachers. Um, of course, uh, passion quizzes, uh, heroes as well, escape games. So this is uh, so all, all the innovative approaches developed by uh, the data protection authorities. And but all, all these materials needed, of course, to be. Uh, we will see on the next slide. Needed to be or um, presented in a more formal way because having uh, content and uh, a roadmap. We considered it was a very useful uh, approach. So we've developed a few years ago, in 2016, an international competency framework uh, to be included, included sorry, in study programs and in curricula. So it's based on a core uh, of nine key competencies to equip children, teens, with the major digital skills to as to allow them at all ages to identify and make assertive decisions related to the protection of their personal data. So, and of course, uh, then uh, you can add and plug materials by age groups, of course. You will see on the following slide, this is an exper experimentation which has been made in France, but also in uh, many other countries because we are uh, currently uh, exchanging with the other data protection authorities to know how far and how best uh, data protection has been integrated in all subject matters because it's the objective to be plugged into mathematics in science uh, not only in technologies or in uh, computer science you see so and here this was a way to analyze the the, the, the current curricula to identify the most appropriate links to find entrance keys and have the data protection and privacy competency framework easily incorporated and facilitated by um, sense making practices for, for teachers um, and giving also, as I said, resources to be uh, to, to be used as a stimulus or as applicable applicable exercises. So next slide, please. Uh, among the, the issues we have uh, uh, considered as a priority, we, we are getting back now to our topics of today related to online learning. And uh, uh, as I said at the beginning of my, of my lecture, data protection authorities have a means to to draw attention to the call to the government and the stakeholders by adopting resolution and uh, the, 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 re the, the recommendation we are uh, discussing today has also been fed with some content of this e-learning platform because now this is a, a very uh, um, a, a very topical issue but uh, we considered it was uh, necessary to to provide recommendations to um, educational authorities, to e-learning platform providers, and also to have data protection authorities committed in this process, to have uh, all the stakeholders considering what obligations they will have to meet. So Pascal, this document Pascal. is available. Yes. Pascal, 
Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Perhaps we can pick up some of your uh, the points that you wish to add in the questions because we've got about 15 minutes left for the question yeah. and answers. And as you can imagine, with the, the points that you make yeah, about how sure. we need to raise awareness amongst young people about these data protection concerns, I'm sure that the questions will reflect some of the uh, yeah. points of interest in your presentation. So let me Ooh. now uh, bring in um, some other comments from people who've been following this webinar. Let me go to to uh, Alessandra Pierucci, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, who is the chair of the Committee of Convention 108. Uh, Alessandra, welcome. Uh, what do you make of the presentation so far? Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Just to, to okay. check whether you can hear Yeah, perfectly. Um, just before raising my questions, uh, if you don't mind, I would size the opportunity to share a general information, which I'm sure is of interest for the audience. Uh, this morning, Convention 108 Plus has been signed by Bosnia and Herzegovina and Malta, bringing therefore the total of signatures to uh, 36. And uh, of course, uh, her ratifications are eagerly uh, awaited, in particular if, you, if we want uh, uh, to have a rapid uh, uh, entry into force of Convention 108 Plus. Uh, I really wanted to share this piece of information with you. Um, let me, uh, of course, uh, thank the speakers very much for their brilliant presentation and their relevant uh, insights they, they brought. Um, as uh, as uh, suggested, I totally agree that it's particularly timely to discuss about distance learning, which has become crucial in the management of the COVID-19 uh, emergency and actually has stimulated also an interesting debate in particular on whether distance learning can be considered a, a tool for inclusion of students, in particular of those uh, who otherwise would not, uh, uh, let's say, benefit from, uh, from learning, or whether, on the contrary, should be considered as a sort of divisive tool, which somehow exacerbates the differences among individuals uh, as it tends to crystallize the original social and economic situation of the individual, including, let's say, disparities or social difficulties, without bringing students uh, on a common and, uh, let's say, socially and economically neutral uh, environment like real physical schools can do. So uh, this is to say that uh, uh, the topic of disparity disparities uh, uh, from a social and economical point of view is of course of crucial importance for education, including in respect of the use of personal data uh, related to students that we allow. And now I come to my question, and I'm referring in particular uh, to Jen Person's work on this and on the draft guidelines on education setting, uh, where uh, it is correctly highlighted that uh, much commercial software in education systems appears to be free, but in reality, uh, behind this, so controllers so sort of economical um, exploitations uh, of, of data. So against this, my question to the speakers, in particular to Jen, uh, do you see the risk that this process, namely the release of personal data in exchange for educational services, exacerbates the difference between those who can, let's say, afford a privacy-protected environment and those who need, because of their economic vulnerability, to release or, let's say, sell their personal data to obtain educational services? Or do you think that paradoxically the use of personal data somehow compensates the disparities uh, of some individuals and put them in the condition to have educational services that otherwise they would not have? So thank you very much again. Uh, thank you, Alessandro. Just before you uh, respond to that, uh, uh, Jen, just let me bring in now uh, Regina Jens Dotti, who is the head of the Children's Rights Division here at the Council of Europe. You have a point to add to our conversation today. Regina? Yes, hello. I'm, I'm trying to turn everything on here. Is, can you see me? It's okay? We can hear you, but we can't see you. But please go ahead and make okay. your point. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, well, I first uh, and foremost, I would just like to congratulate all of the speakers because uh, you really have brought in uh, one of the missing links uh, in uh, the entire children's rights uh, uh, challenges that we see in this uh, digital environment. Uh, you uh, and I'm sure that those that are participating in this event uh, are aware that we have uh, in the Council of Europe, we have um, uh, adopted the guidelines to respect, protect and fulfill the rights of the child in the digital environment, which is a comprehensive uh, recommendation addressing all of the different stakeholders uh, that can uh, make a difference for uh, children in uh, uh, being able to exercise their rights in the digital environment. And of course, data protection is a very big part of, this, uh, of these guidelines. Um, I think that the guidelines that you are now preparing for uh, uh, children's rights in the educational setting, I mean, I think that this has really been at the essence and at the heart of what we have seen as some of the main challenges uh, for children during the COVID crisis. So I think uh, it has really uh, brought, uh, uh, it is no longer just at the tip of the iceberg. It is really one of the major issues. So I feel that uh, this work is really going to carry forward the guidelines, the uh, IT guidelines on, on children's rights uh, in the digital environment. But I think it is also important for us uh, um, to also provide practical tools for um, professionals that need to master data protection. For most uh, persons, uh, professionals, uh, parents, etc., data protection is the GDPR, but they don't really know what else there is. And I think that even schools, uh, they are not able to fully understand and to grasp the importance of uh, uh, the need for the systems and the educational system to be able to re respect children's rights to privacy and data protection. Um, I'm very happy to share with you uh, that we have just recently, during the COVID crisis, we were able to um, finalize a, a leaflet. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, can you see it on the video? I can see myself, but I don't know if you can see me. Can you yes, see we this? Can see it. Yes, we okay. can. Okay, so this is a child-friendly version of the IT guidelines, which is for children and which helps children better understand what their rights are. And there is, of course, an important part on data protection. And I really think that it is important that we are also able to reach out to, to those that are supposed to deliver these rights to the children and to help them um, uh, understand them better. We've also developed an internet literacy handbook, and I was very interested by what um, the, um, what Pascal was saying about this platform of resources. So I would be very happy uh, to share with Sophie, my colleague, uh, the links to the resources that we've developed uh, and which will most definitely be of interest to uh, this platform. And I'll be happy to, to share the work that we have uh, on this. I am uh, very interested. Uh, you know that in the Council of Europe, we have uh, consecutive strategies for the rights of the child. The current strategy is coming to an end at the end of 2021. And I am really looking forward to seeing um, data protection come in as a stronger focus in the priorities for children's rights in the Council of Europe. And I think that this is a, uh, these guidelines that are being prepared are probably uh, one of the, um, the first uh, practical uh, guidelines that we are preparing. And I am really looking forward to seeing us uh, uh, promote them, uh, include them in our cooperation projects, include them in the large palette of tools uh, and instruments that we have, which support uh, the rights of the child in the digital environment. So thank you very much. And thanks to uh, the, the TPD and, of course, to uh, the, the colleagues in the Data Protection Unit for taking the initiative to, uh, to organize this, uh, this event. Uh, thank you, Regina. We're coming to the end of this uh, Q&A. We've only got a few um, more minutes left, but we do have uh, some interesting questions. Let me now uh, go to uh, Jen and to Pascal. We've got a question from uh, Marie Georges. Um, she asks, for fair processing notice, do you promote short and meaningful standardized information for helping anyone to get data protection reflexes? Uh, how would you respond to that, that to that question, Pascal and Jen? Please. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, as as our data protection group is concerned, you know, this was the, the last slide which has hasn't been provided, you know, and the objective in our current work is also to encourage improving information about children exercising their rights 
and develop guidine, guidance on websites with content specifically aimed at children and youth, and also facilitating accessibility of complaints handling process to children. So it means it's among our priorities, as it has just been said, you know, uh, improving uh, visibility of rights for children. Thank you. Jen, uh, Jen, do you have a, a comment to add on that? To that, uh, that Pascal so well explained and that Canil has obviously done such great work on and developing around fair processing. If I may, I'd come back to Alessandro's question. Um, and uh, as quickly as I can, uh, the question around uh, freeware and how whether uh, personal data should be an acceptable trade. And I think it touches very much on the important debate uh, that commonly comes from the US around whether there is ownership of data or whether there is control of data. And it sits on the principle that the foundation of the convention and other data protection law sits on that um, data protection rests around human rights, amongst which is the right to privacy. And I think it is important for children that we look at that not only um, as the right to privacy, to protection from things like exploitation in education, so that we shouldn't say it's acceptable for a child to trade personal data in order to uh, then have to be subjected to ads and be commercially exploited, whereas their rich counterparts, parents, can uh, buy the upgraded product and then be ad-free or be ad uh, accessing additional information. That's not a fair trade. And I think we should be very, very conscious of not giving away our children's rights in, a, in a, a, an unfair trade, which is also the gateway to other rights. So the gateway to the right of the right to participation online, the right to freedom of expression, the right to the protection of their reputation and to their full and free development, and the right in the UNCRC that a child should have the right to flourish. And that is what we need to protect um, for the child as a developing adult. And we should not put a price on that un under the terms and conditions that com companies today offer us. The last part of that to, to, to for, for businesses and for the market and for, for policymakers to also think about is that that data trade currently is very unfair on other businesses. It's not a fair trade across the market. Those players that have large quantities of personal data are empowered and small SMEs are generally disempowered and have disadvantages to the market. And so if we want a fair uh, playing field, for all uh, to be able to enter the market for small companies as well, we should make sure that privacy and data protection enables a fair playing field. It protects children of all kinds and doesn't discriminate against those that have, have more wealth and equally uh, will therefore empower um, businesses as well to be able to, to have a, a fair and transparent and safe playing field uh, across, across the market. Thanks, Jen. Um, we're into the last five minutes of our webinar. Um, can I just bring back in, Patricia, perhaps you want to pick up some of the points that have been raised? Patricia? OK, well, whilst uh, Patricia uh, comes back, let me just put um, some other questions that have come in. We've got uh, two questions by MKS. Um, this is uh, for, the, for all of the experts. The recommendation of the committee states that children should be enabled to both give and withhold consent where they have the capacity to understand the implications and processing is in their own best interests. Does this cover all kinds of personal data, including biometric? How would you respond to that panel, please? Pascal, do you want to take the floor? Yeah, yes, OK. You know, this is a very, very uh, intrusive issue. And uh, regarding schools and minors, above all, you know, bi biometric data has to be considered in a very, very cautious way. All the more since now, nowadays, uh, we, we can imagine people uh, now, instead, for, instead of tracing or touching, will be asking in schools uh, resolve biometrics, you know, so that's why uh, we, we, we have to bet on this 
guidelines as well as an instrument to really uh, frame the, the conditions of using biometrics data when uh, when there is no other means and uh, facilitating uh, identification of, of, of children and minors, you know, so that's a very relevant issue. We, we want to give up on this issue, I'm sure. Thank you, Pascal. Let me, uh, in the closing minutes of this webinar, let me put this second question by MKS to you, uh, Jen. Uh, can an educational institute, a school, organize an entry system by facial recognition of children? Uh, MKS goes on to add, considering some legal systems include the obligation of personal written consent for biometric data processing, whose consent, in your opinion, does a school need to get Childs or guardians? As Pascal said, it touches on the core of, of some of the problematic issues in education. Um, biometric data used for the purposes of identification of a child should only be used where there is no other less invasive method available. And indeed, um, there have been recent rulings uh, under uh, GDPR that uh, consent was not a viable uh, legal basis for the use of a facial recognition system, for example, in Sweden. Uh, France has taken similar uh, court rulings recently, and Poland recently took a decision that uh, using a fingerprint system in a school was unlawful because other methods were available for identification. So we should look at those principles first before we then set out, okay, what have we accepted and what should we use? But of course, um, a parental, uh, the, the role of parental acceptance and of consent is, is very important, especially where um, children are, are very young. As children have developing capacities, it should be recognized that their own uh, rights come to the fore. But again, especially when we're talking about the types of um, information that are collected about the body and about the, the physical being and the, the mental well-being of a child, it's very hard for them to actually fully understand, to be able to give freely given informed consent. And I think consent is a very, very difficult basis for processing children's data and education at all, regardless of whether it comes from the parent or the child. Uh, thank you, Jen. Um, that brings us to the end of this webinar. Let me say a big thank you to the experts for their presentations, to the other speakers for their comments and questions, and of course to you following on Blue Jeans. Join us again in a few minutes for another webinar, this time to discuss issues related to digital identity. If you cannot come back in a few minutes, then join us for day three of this webinar series tomorrow. This webinar series brought to you by the Council of Europe on data protection views from Strasbourg. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>